This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. God, sorry, I keep on getting interrupted by some voice. Uh, I uh, just a little bit of history about uh, India. Um, oddly enough, India was uh, taken over by the British, not uh, by initially by the British government, but by uh, a company, the East India Company, uh, which over, uh, over the 80s and beginning of the 19th century, essentially uh, conquered India, most through trading, but also with some military uh, military backing, um, and uh, uh, eventually controlled much of the country. Now, there is a myth about this, that India was a terribly poor and uncivilized country, and that we were doing them a great favor by uh, taking them over. But if you actually look at the, the economic statistics, India, uh, by the turn of the 19th century, was actually uh, one of the more affluent countries in the world. And just consider the fact that it had built the Taj Mahal, uh, you know, which uh, ranks as one of the great uh, uh, buildings of the pre-Victorian uh, era. Um, and, uh, you know, when you go to India, it, it, there is an enormous British influence. Uh, and you can see that from the taxes. These taxes, uh, based on Austin cars, still uh, uh, dominate uh, uh, most towns. Uh, you can see them everywhere. Um, and uh, there is still, I mean, they are being taken over by Japanese uh, cars now. But uh, uh, everywhere you go, there's uh, signs of the colonial influence. And uh, whenever I go to India, uh, I always feel very much at home for some reason because of uh, uh, the fact that uh, our cultures are so uh, uh, mixed, inter intermingled even. Um, so our, uh, uh, our, our influence uh, was such that uh, in the 1840s, late 1840s, uh, it was decided to build a railway. Um, this was the railway furthest uh, east in the, in the world at the time. Uh, there was a railway in Egypt by then, but uh, you know we were 20 years into our uh, railway age, but uh, there was uh, nothing uh, in, in the rest of the world. And Lord Dalhousie, who was the governor general at the time, um, and uh, had some railway experience and, and actually sat on a committee uh, in Britain about uh, the uh, railway mania and was, was part of that committee. His committee actually tried to tone down the, the railway mania of the 1840s. Um, anyway, he was, uh, uh, became governor general of India and uh, set out a plan. He, he wrote it out in a, a famous note to uh, that uh, India needed to develop a railway network. And, and what's amazing is that, uh, you know, he set out a, a map, uh, unlike, uh, you know, what happened uh, in the UK, where, um, you know, very much uh, um, the uh, railways were built in a haphazard process without any planning. Uh, Dalhousie kind of set out uh, a network on a map with most of which has been actually built. Um, it was a very extensive network. Um, you know, eventually, there were, there were 40,000 miles, but, but, but you know, that, this pretty much uh, represents it. Um, and uh, the capital for this came from British companies. These were British companies, despite their names, the East India Railway, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway. They were set up by uh, British uh, capitalists, people who saw that there was an opportunity to invest in these railways that the government was, was then supporting. And very importantly, uh, they were backed by the government in the following way, uh, which was that uh, they were guaranteed a 5% rate of return on their capital. Uh, so in other words, anybody who invested £100 would get £5 a year uh, in dividends as well as uh, keeping the value of their capital. Uh, and uh, that money was actually paid for by Indian taxpayers. Um, so uh, 
even though the, the capital investment largely came from uh, Britain, uh, the, uh, the, the return was guaranteed uh, by uh, Indian money. Um, and uh, there were two railways uh, initially envisaged. Uh, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway uh, built a 30 mile suburban railway uh, in, the, in the suburbs of, of uh, what is now Mumbai, well, at the time was uh, Bombay. And uh, uh, this, this was uh, very much a, 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 you know, envisaged as a, as a kind of short urban line. It was a test to see whether uh, people would use the railway, whether goods would be carried on the railway. Whereas the East India Railway, as you'll see in a minute, was their first line was a, a much longer line uh, on the other side of India, uh, from uh, uh, close to, to uh, Calcutta. And amazing enough, you might be wondering why I'm showing this rather poor image of what was an absolutely amazing event, the opening of the first railway, uh, you know, east of, of uh, Cairo and uh, essentially in, in the whole continent. Um, and uh, yet there are no images of this opening. Um, which is strange because it was covered by the Illustrated London News, but this is virtually the only image uh, that uh, one can find anywhere uh, on the on the internet. Um, and this is a period when you know, photography was was just about feasible, and uh, you know certainly people are ready to illustrate things. So it's a great shame that there is no better image because you can imagine what this must have been like. That the, the streets were uh, crowded with thousands of people. Um, and the Indian people were astonished at the arrival of uh, the Iron Road and particularly of steam locomotives. You know, there wasn't much ind industry in India at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it was unlike Manchester, Liverpool at the time, they, their railways opened. So, uh, you know, it would have been an astonishing event and it's a shame there was no uh, image of it. Uh, um, there was, this is a sort of rather strange kind of picture again of, of uh, you know, suggestion that this might have been the first journey. I doubt it uh, uh, very much. Um, and this might be a picture of uh, the first journey of the Lord Falkland, which was uh, uh, the, the initial uh, uh, the initial uh, engine that uh, 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 carried people for uh, uh, the first time. Um, Um, and there was certainly uh, some major work. This was not quite part of the first bit of the railway, but it was soon uh, part of the extension. Uh, those of you who've been to uh, Mumbai will know that uh, you know, some 20, 30 miles behind Mumbai, there's, there's a, a set of mountains called the Ghats, which pretty much run down the whole coast, uh, the whole uh, western coast of, of India. Um, and uh, to get through them, through to Pune, which is the nearest uh, major town to Mumbai, required major works. So and now you might think that the scaffolding looks pretty precarious, but actually uh, bamboo is just as good as uh, steel in many ways uh, uh, as a way of, of building, uh, uh, of, of, of erecting scaffolding. But this is perilous work, and a lot of people did uh, get killed by falling. Uh, but many more died of the disease from uh, uh, working on this railway, including many of the uh, British people. And this is this was uh, the railway behind uh, Mumbai until around the 1930s. And you can see uh, uh, the bit on the left is a sort of safety uh, runoff. Uh, the, the trains would clearly run to the end, uh, and you'd uh, 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 change the points, and they would run up the next section, and so on. And, and this type of railway was quite prominent. Uh, both in India and in the Andes, it has now been replaced, of course, by a tunnel and an electrified uh, uh, railway. Uh, um, sorry, I went, I jumped one too many there. Um, uh, you know, this again shows that the perilous kind of uh, uh, way that work was carried out. Uh, the British tried to persuade people to use wheelbarrows, um, but they actually always preferred to carry stuff on their heads and when they tried to get them to use wheelbarrows, they merely carried the wheelbarrows on their heads. Um, and uh, so that didn't really uh, uh, prove to be effective. Um, oddly enough, there was a woman involved that was pretty, pretty amazing at the time. Uh, Alice Treadwell was married uh, to an engineer who was supposed to build uh, 
part of the first section. Uh, he, like many people, quickly succumbed to disease, and she managed, with the help of uh, some of his former colleagues, to actually build a section of the railway. And, and she is fated uh, uh, in the museums and stuff as an uh, amazing uh, phenomenon by, by uh, uh, the Indians. So over the other side of the country, um, from near Calcutta, we didn't go over the bridge at the time, so from near Calcutta, Power, which is just the other side of the, of the river, uh, through to uh, um, uh, the, the coal fields, the Rani Ganj is the actual place it ended up, the, the coal fields of, uh, of, of India. This was very much a, a coal railway uh, that uh, um, was, was uh, uh, for use um, uh, by coal trains um, and, as you see, cotton trains and the like. And this is about 120 miles long, so it was much longer than the initial uh, than the initial uh, railway of uh, on the other side of the country. Um, and uh, as you can see, carrying coal and cotton in, in huge amounts. Uh, through to the port of uh, Calcutta. These initial railways, uh, and much of the initial railways, were, were basically about transporting uh, raw materials to the ports and bringing in manufactured uh, uh, materials from them. And that was that was essentially. So, so you know, it was very much kind of uh, part of uh, the British intent to make use of. Uh, these railways to, to kind of boost uh, their own economic uh, position. But, it, but it, they weren't really designed as passenger railways, but, but just as in Britain, they found that actually uh, lots of people wanted to travel by rail and uh, uh, lots of Indians wanted to travel by rail and became a, a major kind of uh, part of their use. And uh, this, this is a stamp kind of celebrating 150 uh, uh, years of the, the opening of uh, uh, of the East Indian uh, line, which was would have, should, should, have, should have been the first uh, line, but uh, the locomotive uh, locomotives that were uh, destined to, to pull the trains, which were uh, built in in Britain, uh, were transported to Australia by mistake. Um, and uh, and then brought back, and then they were in a ship that actually sank, and so this, uh, the opening of the railway was actually uh, delayed by a, a couple of years. But there are some, uh, you know, engravings and and uh, uh, even photographs of what uh, that opening must have looked like, uh, which there wasn't for uh, the uh, uh, Bombay to Thana uh, railway. And as you can see, there was quite a uh, you know, for the time, quite a modern railway, um, and uh, um, was was used uh, material that was entirely imported uh, from the UK, which which is you know, one of the one of the great kind of uh, issues around the the colonial development of the railway, in that it was never uh, really seen as. Um, Possible for the Indians to supply uh, all the materials uh, and, and uh, the uh, equipment, uh, which was a big mistake. Of course, it, it would have been perfectly possible for them to develop their own industries, but but the British effectively didn't allow them to do so. There were several mishaps in the early days of the railways, uh, not least because uh, uh, two things actually. The, the first of all, the, a lot of bridges collapsed because uh, both the there was an underestimate of how strong the bridges needed to be to resist uh, the very strong currents uh, in the monsoon period and also for the runoff from uh, the Himalayas, which uh, is very strong uh, at certain points uh, of the year and in, in the spring. Um, and But also partly as a result of corruption. Uh, there were a lot of contractors on these lines, and some of them, uh, you know, didn't use enough uh, cement or concrete uh, to, to bind the, the bridges together, and so on. Uh, so, and that was, uh, you know, quite a quite a quite a, a big issue. So there were several kind of uh, bridge collapses, where there were the kind of uh, major uh, accidents in the in the early years of the railway. And then things changed. Um, 1857 is a key 
date in Indian history because uh, we call it the mutiny. Uh, the Indians call it, uh, you know, the first battle of independence. So I've used the term halfway through calling it the, the Indian rebellion. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a ghastly period. There were massacres on both sides. Uh, the, the, essentially, it was uh, the, the sepoys, the America, the um, Indian uh, soldiers who uh, rebelled, but also some local people. And this changed uh, things in several ways. First of all, the East India Company uh, was essentially taken over by the government. And so things were run by the government rather than by the East India Company. And also uh, there was a much kind of harder line towards uh, the Indians. <coughs> there was an expectation that they would uh, rebel again so there was much less uh, kind of uh, interaction uh, and uh, really it was kind of the takeover of India as, as, a, as a, a colony rather than as a, a kind of partnership in, in growth. And the effect on the railways was that uh, it speeded up railway development. And because the military saw the railways as a key way of protecting uh, the country against rebellion because it was cheaper to actually transport a bunch of soldiers around the, the country. And there were very few British soldiers, but there were some and they were the officers. Um, and it was cheaper to uh, bring them around the country rather than uh, building lots of barracks and having vast numbers of more soldiers. So, so the railway is the key kind of defense. Uh, mechanism and therefore uh, this spurred on uh, uh, their development and and by the 1870s we get much of the uh, 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 the, the the network that uh, um, uh, was uh, 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 was eventually developed you know, a couple of couple of thousand miles or about two or three thousand miles of line by then um, and major uh, the ports as you can see were a major part of uh, uh, the development of the railway. Um, and it also changed um, the, the attitude of the British. They built uh, stations that were easily defendable. Now, this is uh, Lahore, which is now, of course, in, uh, uh, in, in Pakistan rather than in uh, India. Uh, there was, of course, partition uh, uh, in 1947, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but as you can see, uh, they started building uh, stations that were were uh, very defendable, uh, um, and uh, uh, notably uh, uh, in Hyderabad, uh, which I was in uh, last year and, and, and saw this in, in Madras, which is now called uh, Chennai. And these are substantial kind of uh, stations, but also you can see with the limited entrances to them, uh, uh, easily defendable. And of course, the most famous. Uh, which is uh, Victoria Station in Bombay, which is now uh, named after a uh, uh, Marathi uh, freedom fighter uh, called Chaharapati. Uh, and uh, everybody uh, actually still calls the station uh, Victoria Station. Uh, uh, you know, taxi driver will say, uh, you know, go to VS, VS, uh, Victoria Station. Um, and as you can see, there's sort of elements of sort of some pancreas there, elements of, uh, uh, you know, Victorian Gothic uh, uh, in there and extraordinary. I mean, these were built in, later in the century, but uh, you know, extraordinary kind of uh, 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 constructions. And, and it was, a, you know, it was a difficult business kind of operating a railway in, in uh, India. There are all these issues, you know, religious sensibilities, two major religions uh, and then sub-religions. Uh, you know, would the people travel together or caste issues? As I'm sure you know, uh, the Indian society is divided into into you know, dozens of different castes according to what job and, and according to your parents or whatever. Uh, provision of toilets, they didn't provide any toilets initially, uh, but which was, was, was uh, ludicrous. And so trains had to stop for, for toilets and stuff. Uh, and they said, well, it's too expensive to provide them or whatever. Um, the issue of women, some some particularly the uh, Muslims were not sure that their wives should travel in the same uh, compartments as uh, as men, as the kind of non-related men. 
Um, uh, you know, would the Europeans travel entirely on their own? Well, not entirely, because they did travel in first and second class, but uh, there were some, uh, you know, affluent Indians and middle class Indians who actually traveled in those uh, classes as well. So there's an awful lot of issues. A lot of railway companies, this picture I took in, the, in Delhi, is all the, the signs of all the different railway companies. There were about 50 in the end. Uh, some local authorities, some uh, uh, Indian companies, but uh, some states, but mostly uh, uh, mostly private uh, British companies. The, the five percent didn't last forever. They were then required to earn a slightly lesser rate of uh, return, uh, but nevertheless still uh, uh, enough to make it uh, worthwhile. And the Indians took to the railways. And they just loved traveling on the railways, and and uh, 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 you know, given that the main roads were terrible and still still are in many places. Uh, and the fastest means of travel is probably ox carts, which you know are lucky to take to get three miles an hour. So when the railways could do 40, 50 miles an hour, um, you know, clearly it was a very popular way of traveling, uh, pilgrimage and whatever the like. Um, I mean, this is not really kind of what they look like now. People don't really travel on, on in that way. And they probably didn't as much as the, in those days, but they did travel on the roofs quite a lot. Um, and uh, with all the risks uh, that it inhaled, entailed. Um, I was in Hyderabad uh, last year and, and the Nizam, which is kind of the Maharaja of Hyderabad, uh, the, what, the, the, the third or fourth, I think he was in the late 19th century, early 20th, uh, built a, a whole network of railways uh, in his state. Um, uh, and even built, and even later on, uh, had buses connected with the with the railways and kind of built a whole transport system. Um, so it, it wasn't all kind of built uh, by the by the British. And one type of railways, I, I've talked about several types of railways. One type of railways, famine railways. They thought that if you built a railway to somewhere, uh, it would relieve famine. When in fact, actually, famine is largely caused by the price of food going up and people being unable to pay for it and, and uh, uh, but they, with pictures like this they kind of thought here's the British doing a lot of good and, and, and saving people from famine when actually uh, the Indian nationalists were pushing for uh, the building of canals so that their um, uh, fields could get irrigated and that would have uh, been a better way of, of uh, ensuring steady food supply rather than uh, uh, railways and indeed one of the stories of my book is that uh, one of the one of the railways, the Bengal Nagpur Railway, that was built for the purpose of relieving famine, was funded by the Rothschilds, and uh, um, who were big bankers at the time and built a lot of railways in in, in Europe. And uh, the uh, the British at the time thought, well, um, the local people are getting the benefit of this railway; they ought to pay for it, and so they taxed the local people. To ensure that the Rothschilds got their rate of return, so virtually the poorest people in the world were being taxed by uh, the British in order to pay for a railway they didn't need uh, uh, that was actually owned by the richest people in the world. So, not always, uh, not always an equitable idea. The other type of railway that was inter of interest uh, was the Hill Station Railway. Uh, particularly, you know, many of you I'm sure will be familiar with the Darjeeling Railway. Um, which this is a picture from. The, the, uh, these were built because the British tended to spend uh, their winters, uh, sorry, their summers uh, when it got too hot uh, uh, before the monsoons arrived in June, July, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the comfort of the hill stations where it was cooler, and so railways were built uh, to to uh, link them. Uh, there's kind of uh, five or six of these railways. They're all now kind of World Heritage sites. Uh, this was the Nilgiri Railway, which is uh, further down south uh, in Kerala, and uh, uh, which, which, uh, which you'll see, uh, uh, I visited uh, uh, relatively recently, um, and uh, uh, which was actually a rack railway. You can see uh, from the picture of me there, you can see in the middle that uh, part of it, the first part of it, was on such a steep incline that uh, it was built as a rack railway uh, with the with the third rail kind of. Uh, uh, in the middle and still, still, uh, still, still in use. Uh, and this is one of the most famous of these railways. Uh, and as you can see, it's not always warm in India. Uh, 
and this is the uh, other one. Uh, unfortunately, I was going to travel on this one in, in uh, last year, and uh, it was closed by a landslide, um, and uh, I think remains in trouble. You can possibly see why. As permanent way people, you probably would be slightly critical of uh, the state of uh, that railway. Um, then there was another type of railways, which are the military railways, largely built in the northeast on the on the frontier, uh, uh, sorry, the northwest frontier, um, and uh, adjoining Afghanistan. And these were built because there was uh, supposedly a constant threat that. Uh, in particular, the Russians uh, would go through Afghanistan and then invade in India from uh, the West. An unlikely scenario, given how difficult Afghanistan is militarily, but nevertheless one that uh, was uh, at various times of the Victorian era put forward as a as a uh, likely scenario. Uh, so some extraordinary railways uh, were built, including the Khyber Pass Railway. Um, which which almost stretch into Afghanistan. It goes right up to the border of Afghanistan. They did want to continue it into Afghanistan, but never uh, managed to uh, 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 to do that. And this was uh, again, um, you know, as engineers, you'll you'll recognise that this was a, a pretty extraordinary railway, um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, was very little used. Ultimately, because you know, these are tribal areas, pretty wild part of the country, and uh, uh, really was not built for local people, but built entirely for military uh, purposes. But uh, later on, they did try and attract uh, people to visit it, and, and indeed, right up to the latest Afghan troubles, it started in, in the 80s, 90s, uh, that they, they did actually keep it, keep, uh, it open. And, uh, certainly between the wars, which this poster is taken from, um, they, they uh, had tourist trains going there. Um, oddly enough, there's not many tourist trains which advertise the kind of people showing guns, uh, but apparently these tribes would often travel on the train. They were, they were as a, a, a concession to them, were allowed to travel free on the, on the local trains. Um, and then there's the most remarkable of these railways, which stretches all the way into uh, Iran. Uh, which apparently still exists um, and was at one point seen as possibly a way of linking east and west and, and running a, a railway all the way through. Um, and uh, 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 starts at Quetta Krit in, in what is now in Pakistan um, and ran through very uh, dry uh, country with extraordinary uh, construction. Um, and yeah, it must be one of the loneliest, that must be the loneliest station in the world, I somewhat suspect. Um, and uh, uh, has a lot of trouble with, uh, with sand. Occasionally trains have to stop and clear the sand away, but, but apparently it does still run a weekly train or something, but it's difficult to find out much about it. Uh, at the other end of the market, there was kind of very uh, comfortable, uh, trains that were uh, on a par with anything in the world, actually, in terms of luxury. This is kind of turn of the century stuff, um, and really is 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 uh, you know uh, amazing stuff, uh, amazing kind of uh, uh, railway experience. Good food on the trains, uh, you know, very comfortable first class, uh, quite fast. There were trains, the fastest trains were those that ran. Uh, from Bombay to Delhi, because uh, people would arrive on the boats from Bombay and, and seek to get to Delhi as uh, uh, quickly as possible. But you know, you could travel in style. Uh, much of this was aimed at, of course, the European market, um, which is the first class market. But actually, most people, of course, travel in third class. And indeed, interestingly enough, most of the revenue for the railways came from third class. And very often, even though first class might cost two or three times what third class cost, it was still very cheap by European standards and was really heavily subsidized in terms of the, uh, the, the, what was, what was uh, uh, being offered. But uh, you know, again, showing some uh, uh, just the, the sophisticated nature of the, the, the railways in, in, in India. Uh, and this was a train that was uh, ran the race, the big race uh, courses are at Pune. Um, and uh, you know the equivalent of a derby, 
and uh, this this was a train that was only uh, took Europeans uh, until uh, after the Second World War. Um, you know, it was, it was Indians were not allowed to travel on this train. Uh, quite extraordinary, really. Um, and again, you know, this this shows this this the uh, the, the difference in in, in comfort standards. Um, uh, and it was all British technology essentially uh, that uh, um, was it was imported uh, um, to build both the carriages and uh, the the, uh, the locomotives. And most of the drivers, or nearly all the drivers, were Europeans, were white, uh, and the firemen were tended to be uh, were all pretty much uh, Indians. And occasionally the Indians got promoted. Uh, to um, uh, uh, drive freight trains or, or shunting engines, but, but they were never allowed to drive, drive the, uh, the expresses. There was a, you know, essentially a total color bar between the, uh, between the races. Um, so not surprisingly enough, the railways became a source of dissent uh, in, in, the, in India. They were, like in Britain, one of the first areas that were heavily unionized. Blocking off the railways was always a, often a tactic, and the railway workers were uh, amongst the most radical uh, workers. And many of them campaigned uh, for uh, independence and uh, you know stopped the trains uh, at various points uh, in the 20th century. Um, and just a, as kind of a side, that you know part part of the anger that was created in relation to uh, the uh, uh, British was that uh, the Indians uh, sent a, 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 you know, about a million people to uh, uh, fight in the First World War, uh, a very undercovered uh, uh, There is in, in that film 1917, which came out last year, there, there, there was a Sikh guy at one point. It's shown, I think this was a homage to, 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 uh, to these people. And uh, Gandhi, of course, used the railways a lot. And as you can see, traveled in third class. Uh, uh, as noted there, and uh, um, he uh, uh, really made use of the fact that uh, the, rail, the, the treatment of, of Indian people in the railways was uh, pretty shabby, um, and they travelled in terrible conditions while, while uh, the Europeans travelled in, in such uh, excellent conditions. Um, and at, one, at some point, Gandhi actually wrote pieces against the railways uh, uh, totally, but but generally afterwards he he uh, uh, he made very heavy use of them and and used them as a political uh, uh, weapon. Railways did start to get improved quite early on. Uh, but this is part of the, the amazing uh, Mumbai uh, suburban network, which you know, still today carries uh, uh, literally. Uh, I think I think the figure is actually something like eight million journeys a day um, uh, in the in the uh, uh, on the network and, and in, in incredibly crowded uh, conditions. But uh, so the railways were an important part of the freedom struggle that, that fed up, particularly in the uh, interwar period, and very much in the uh, uh, you know resulted in in, in uh, independence in 1947. Um, and uh, oddly enough, the, there were some battles on the railways in uh, the uh, Second World War, but the, the, the railways had been built at the wrong place. Uh, it was in the northeast, really, that uh, where the Japanese were trying to invade, that uh, the railways needed to be strengthened, and there was quite some uh, uh, battles around uh, uh, the railways. Um, uh, to, to prevent the Japanese from uh, invading from that, that side. And actually the railway from Calcutta up north uh, was taken over by the Americans as, because it was so important in creating the supply route to, to ensure that the Japanese were not able to invest. Of course, uh, um, the Burma wasn't quite uh, a part of India, but it was uh, a neighboring India, of course, the Death Railway, which was ran between Burma and, uh, and Thailand, uh, built largely by local people, but with about 30,000 pr prisoners of war uh, involved and, uh, uh, you know, the bridge on the river Kwai and all that. Uh, uh, so in 1947, uh, we get the independence and the railways again play a major part in that, in transporting large uh, 
amounts of, of Muslims to the two bits of Pakistan, um, which became Pakistan and Bangladesh later on, um, and uh, the uh, uh, and, and taking Muslims out of Pakistan, uh, sorry, taking Hindus out of Pakistan and, and into uh, the India. And there were massacres on both sides, of terrible conditions. Uh, probably about a, a, a couple of million people were killed, although there, there's no particularly accurate figures. And the railways were completely clogged up by this, um, and, and with, with uh, you know, actually huge numbers of people traveling in both directions. Um, and so we get the Indian Railways uh, at independence. And uh, Nehru, who was the first prime minister, was very keen on building the, the network. Note how similar this slide is to, uh, to Dalhousie's plan. Uh, you know, with a big concentration of railways in the north, uh, fewer railways in the, in, the, in the south, but very much kind of uh, followed uh, uh, his design and, and uh, the, the planned railway. Um, and uh, uh, it was taken over by uh, Indian Railways. And of course, uh, despite the fact that many of the Europeans fled straight away and, and even uh, many of, of the, the Anglo-Indians, the kind of people who were, uh, were partly of European descent, uh, were not particularly well treated um, and, and a lot left the industry. Uh, then uh, the railways did function well and continued to be invested in and uh, developed um, and uh, were a major part of the infrastructure as uh, the state-owned uh, Indian Railways, which they are still uh, uh, today. And a workshop was developed, um, you know, which again, the British had not allowed, I mean, they'd allowed repairs, but not, not anywhere where trains were manufactured. And quickly, India built up its own industry, which now it's uh, run in partnership with the Japanese. A great lost opportunity, of course, by by, by Britain there. Um, and this is the the, the works that was uh, that were uh, still uh, much of the uh, uh, railway rolling stock is is uh, built. Uh, new lines were built. Uh, this is the biggest of the new lines, which runs uh, from uh, Mumbai south uh, to Goa. Uh, a very scenic uh, line um, had some troubles at the beginning because it was it was difficult to construct, uh, but a heavily used uh, railway. And you can see this is a passenger train, and you can see they they usually routinely have 24 to 25 coaches. Uh, you know they're actually enormous. So the platforms in the major stations are, are uh, enormous. But freight is the mainstay of the of the Indian railways. Uh, uh, freight is very profitable. Um, Indeed, it cross subsidizes the uh, uh, the passenger, uh, as you'll see in a minute, the passenger railway is uh, incredibly, incredibly cheap. Um, and this is some typical scenes, uh, uh, some of these photographs I took myself of uh, of Indian railways. I mean, the bars are really to stop people uh, leaning their heads out. Um, and, um, and actually these, the, 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 the Trains are hot, but they're not uh, by any means unbearable. And uh, but of course, the windows are pretty much open all year, all year round. Um, and um, you know, all the all the, the carriages pretty much uh, look like this. Um, this was a day of a strike, actually, but it just shows the sort of overcrowding and uh, um, that that happens when the trains are not running. Um, and you know, here's the sort of suburban kind of uh, typical. Uh, way of traveling. And now, uh, I mean, one terrible statistic is that something like five people a day get killed on their on their system uh, by either falling off trains or, or being run over by trains. All the lines uh, are used as kind of shortcuts. So there's many people walking along the suburban lines as well as uh, obviously traveling on the on, on the trains. Uh, this is a picture I took because uh, you know, for disabled people, and yet uh, there's actually no way they can get up easily up the steps into that disabled carriage. This is uh, uh, this, this is a train I took uh, uh, from about halfway through uh, um, in in uh, uh, um, uh, really in a, in a tribal from a, a tribal state uh, in, on the western side of uh, uh, India, um, and you can see that the price. 
uh, even of a, of a very long journey is a mere 280 uh, 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 rupees, uh, um, which uh, you know is about uh, under three pounds. Um, and uh, uh, you know, typically, um, and that's even in first class, and uh, much cheaper in, in kind of uh, uh, second or third class. Um, and and I, these are still typically uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, prices you, you still pay. Um, and so that you know the railways are, are remarkably cheap. Of course, many people traveling on them. Uh, I mean, we're talking pre-COVID, of course, but um, uh, you know they they, they, they still uh, uh, you know uh, operate uh, as I say with a subsidy from uh, freight uh, freight travel. Uh, this is a picture I took because our train stopped and uh, there was something wrong with the line and they just kind of um, got up there and tried to fix the overhead equipment, <laughs> uh, which again, I'm sure uh, you wouldn't want to see it happen in this country. This is a, just a picture to show that they nicked the underground sign uh, for all the, uh, all uh, basically all the uh, stations have these uh, uh, names names with uh, using the underground sign. Uh, this is a this is a, a the station I used uh, to get on the train um, and uh, it was it's quite a busy kind of uh, station because uh, it's where the, on the single track the trains can cross and you'd have thought that by now they might have built uh, a platform on the other side but actually you have to get on the tracks by uh, going through the train on the right there uh, going up and down through it, and then waiting on the tracks for the other other train going in the other direction, uh, which uh, is pretty pretty extraordinary, really. That uh, they've never built another another uh, platforms. Uh, apparently, they, they they were going to. Um, uh, I talked to some politicians about it, about how scandalous it was. And they thought, oh yeah, yeah, we'll make sure we get a platform there. Uh, this is uh, steam engines on the Nilgiri railway. Um, and uh, that's uh, uh, that's my lot. I hope you enjoy that. And I hate doing this virtually. I'd much rather be with you uh, to uh, chat afterwards. But uh, there we are. And I understand I will be taking questions. Thank you very much for listening virtually. OK, thank you. If there are any questions, if you please put them in the chat function, and we'll read them out. I've got one to start with, Christian. Uh, you've obviously mentioned some visits recently. Are there any journeys that you can recommend or ones that you would wish, wish to do? Uh, well, uh, I actually took a, a journey all the way around uh, at various times. So uh, when, when I went there to write the book, we went down from uh, Mumbai to Kerala. I would absolutely recommend doing that. Uh, Kerala is the most wonderful state. The weather is absolutely perfect. The people uh are fantastically friendly um the scenery is is majestic there's lots of uh, sea uh, uh coastal uh, but also some some hills and uh i mean kerala is my favorite place in india um and i'd certainly uh, take the train there um i think uh going up the other coast is also a fascinating journey um and complete the tour by uh, going from Delhi to, uh, uh, to sorry, from uh, Calcutta to Delhi or Calcutta to uh, uh, to uh, Mumbai. I mean, the whole thing takes maybe ten or days in the trains, and and you add a couple couple of uh, another ten days just to stay in places and whatever. Um, and you can get a pass for a relatively small couple. I mean, it cost me a couple of hundred quid, it's probably a bit more than that now, but. Uh, you know, I would recommend a, a trip round, uh, basically around the whole country. But if you only could, got time to do one thing, I would go from Mumbai down to Kerala, uh, both for the scenery and for the fact that Kerala is really worth visiting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Webber has asked, what are the main track gauges in India? Sorry, uh, the, the track gauge is is uh, uh, five foot three, oddly enough. Um, uh it's unclear as to why that is the case um dalhousie kind of discussed it in great length uh in his uh, uh 
uh, in his, his notes about creating a railway um, and for some reason uh, chose this rather strange gauge, uh, which I think is the same as Irish uh, uh, railroad. Uh, um, and uh, um, there's no kind of rational explanation as to why. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously it does, you know, it makes, there, there was quite a lot of meter gauge as well. So the, the, the lesser lines were built on meter gauge, which again is rather odd that they chose a metric gauge rather than a, uh, an imperial one. Uh, but most of the meter gauge has now been uh, taken out and uh, uh, extended to, to wide gauge. Uh, there's, a, there's a few, two or three thousand miles left of uh, meter gauge. So, uh, and also there is the commitment to electrify the network uh, and uh, it's something like 60% electric now and they, they want it to be 100% electric by 2030, whether they'll achieve that target or not is another matter. They are also building a high speed line whose gauge I don't actually know, uh, but I suspect it will be the same gauge, but I'm, I don't actually know. They're building a, a high speed line from, uh, uh, from Mumbai up to Amritsar, but I, I, I don't know what the gauge of that is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, there's a clarification from Richard Brown on gauge sizes. I'm saying it's five foot six inches. I don't know that. Uh, another probably question from my side. How much of a political influence is there uh, on the railway in India? Because that's uh, obviously a big subject in the UK at the moment. Yes, I mean enormously. Uh, the railways are very political. Um, in fact, you know, it's very difficult to get fares increases, so that's partly why they're, they're so low. There was, until about three or four years ago, a railways ministry. Uh, that's how you know how important it was. It's now been uh, subsumed into uh, uh, into the um, transport ministry, um, about which there was a lot of argument. But nevertheless, uh, certainly the local politicians are always batting for their own trains. So, uh, you know, if there's proposals to uh, close a line or something, they will always be on the case. Uh, you know, they, they uh, also want to ensure that there's always trains to the major uh, cities and so on. So, so there's absolutely uh, uh, politics comes to play in it the whole time. Um, and and still does and and still stops there being a kind of reasonable amount of fares rising. Right, thank you. Uh, got a question from Sam Cox who says, from his experience, first and second class tickets on long distance trains get booked up weeks in advance. And are the trains trains essentially too cheap? And that's obviously relevant. Um, to in my experience, they're not. I mean. Uh, it's certainly worthwhile buying the tickets before you go. And, and there was a little uh, uh, agency in Wembley, which seems to have the, the and it was mentioned in my book, seems to have the, a, a monopoly of, uh, of selling Indian railway tickets, or it did when I went uh, uh, five years ago. Um, uh, I don't think they get entirely full, but yes, on a, some trains they do, of course. Uh, um, uh, you know, of course, they are in a way too cheap. Um, uh, and as I suggested, the, the 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 difference is too cheap because the difference even today between first class and and uh, uh, second class and uh, I don't think there is a third class anymore. Actually, uh, there is just second class AC and second class non AC. Um, I would recommend the AC. Uh, um, it is still far too great. Um, and you know, first class you get your own little compartment and, and uh, uh, whatever. Second class you're in a huge kind of sleeping compartment with kind of you know about 60, 70 bunks. Um, and and uh, but the price difference is not that enormous. All right, um, probably I'll do one more final one for me. How much of the influence in obviously in the current rally are there are any private operators in India? No, <laughs> no, it's all, it's all, uh, it's, it's all basically uh, uh, state railways um, uh, and run as an integrated railway system. I, I have no evidence that they've separated out the track and the infrastructure. 
and it's all uh, essentially Indian Railways. Um, I think there's probably some private freight operators and stuff about which I, I don't really know, but there's certainly no passenger railways that are private. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, if there are any more questions out there, can anyone quickly put them in? Okay, if there are any more, I'd like to invite Fiona Thompson, who should be online somewhere, to unmute herself and give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Mike. I am somewhere. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. can. Oh, good. Right. So I just sort of had checked that before I went much further. Well, first of all, on behalf of London Section, I'd like to thank Christian for stepping in because unfortunately our previous speaker was was unable. To, uh, our previous book speaker was unable to do do so. So although although Christian, I know you said you hated to be able to present virtually. I'm very pleased to say that we loved having you present virtually. Um, <laughs> although, yes, yeah, so I think we'd all much rather be back in a nice uh, in a in a in a proper venue, but uh, until yeah. that, until until that can happen, I, I, I again I want to say very very big thank you for for stepping in and helping us like this. And as always, we we love listening to you. So I suppose really I I kind for myself I I I think it's very I think it's very important to obviously or essential to acknowledge the, the past, although sometimes it's not that comfortable for me as a British person hearing about it. But uh, I'm. But thank you for uh, you presented it. You presented you presented it very very clearly. The, the the takeover by trade and with the military with basically Britain's military backing, and the the mythology the myths that got per perpetrated as part of the clone the whole colonialism, while still my, while still showing the the physical the physical and engineering triumphs of of, create, of creating the railway. I was fascinated to see some of those early photos, those, those early photographs, uh, especially of the, 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 the structures that are quite uh, the V-shaped return up the uh, hill return. And um, somebody I want to definitely, I'm definitely going to go and find out a bit more about if I can is Alice Treadwell. Oh yeah, she's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to know a lot more about her. And uh, and, uh, and I was just, I was quite boggled by the uh, prospect of the original locomotive. For the, for the East Indian Railway Company being sent off to Australia. So did they keep them or did they send them back? No, no, they no, no, it, was, uh, it, was back? Sent, it was sent back. It was sent back. But uh, I think it, it then sank when it was sent back. So it, it first went to Australia, then it okay. sank, and then they had to send out a, a, a new bunch. Wow. And the that's all I can say about that one, really. Um, that's never happened to us um, on London Underground for the kind I know of. So. That's something, and also the, the looking at the looking at the effects of the monsoon on the structures. Uh, that again, from a to me as a civil engineer, that's 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 very interesting because of course the the, the implications for, uh, for for the structures across the world with climate change and so on. So we probably should learn something from that. Uh, and I said it's great that it brought it up for us right up to the right up to the present day. Uh, and hope we can learn the learn the right lessons from 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 history, and uh, and and very much in, very much hope to see where the railway goes next, well, so to speak. But okay, thank well, you very thank, much. Thank you very, thank you very much. And uh, uh, if anybody wants to buy the book, I, I do have some copies of me. They can just email me. And yeah, I think I by mistake said five foot three. It's five foot six, of course. Uh, uh, the Indian Gate, uh, even even wider uh, um, uh, than, than I said. And on the point of colonialism, I, I wouldn't want to diminish the fact that you know the British did contribute a lot towards building the railways. But if Boris Johnson gets up once more and say, "Oh, we built the railways for the Indians," uh, you know, I think I want to shoot him. I mean, of course, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't an act of altruism. We didn't say, "Oh, oh, these 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 Indian wallers, they 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 want a railway and." And uh, um, you know what a good idea it is. I mean, it was done for uh, you know our own means, uh, our own kind of requirements. The fact that it then enormously benefit India was uh, almost by mistake. I mean, we certainly didn't build any roads in India, uh, and they, the roads you know are still greatly inadequate as a result of that. 
So, you know, uh, that's all I'm trying to debunk the myth. I wouldn't want to say that, you know, it wasn't a, an amazing achievement to build uh, uh, the railway network in India. It was uh, astonishing. Oh, no, quite. I, I just meant that uh, I thought I thought you did, you did well in presenting. I wanted to thank you for presenting it so clearly because it is difficult, I think, sometimes to 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 I'm not sure how I'm going, what I'm trying to say. I suppose it's a, 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 I, I suppose I've tended not to want. It's almost like car crash television sometimes, seeing what the British Empire, what or the so-called British Empire used to do, or any colonial powers did. But it doesn't dim it, take away from, you say, the physical achievements of what actually, whatever the motivation of what took place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very so, much. And uh, uh, as I say, yes, please do buy the book, and I'll happily give a a real talk to you on my next one, which is called Cathedrals of Steam, which is uh, coming out in November, and is uh, the story of uh, the terminus stations in London, the dozen, the twelve terminus stations in London. Now that sounds fabulous. Yes. Okay, watch out for it. Thanks. Thank you.